It's right there. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Good. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. My name is Marcus Miller. I'm the director of the Gordon Snellgrove Gallery. Uh, I'm going to hand this off to uh, David Riviere in a minute. I just want, wanted to uh, recognize that we're on Treaty 6 territory, uh, homeland of the Métis, and uh, we thank our Aboriginal brothers and sisters for sharing this land with us. And I want to introduce uh, David LaRiviere, who's the Artistic Director of Paved Arts. And uh, this talk is really um, uh, seeds for it were planted with uh, uh, paved programming, bringing in Ruth Marsh, who's opening up, is it tomorrow night? Yes. yes. Tomorrow evening. Thursday, Thursday evening. Check it out. Friday. Friday. Today, Today being Thursday. Today being Thursday, it is. <laughs> Tomorrow is Friday. We, we can do this. We can, we can do this. Go team. Go team. So David, uh, uh, Artistic uh, Director of Paved Art, please. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, coming out for this uh, very exciting talk that we're about to engage in. So, uh, we're going to begin with uh, Dr. Art Davis, who's joining us from the Department of Biology. Uh, you're a professor uh, in that department, uh, Art, and uh, he does deliver uh, courses uh, within that department on bees, and that was partly uh, why we approached him. Uh, the artist whose work will be on display tomorrow, do uh, I say doctor as well, but, but you do look like a doctor in, in the lab. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ruth Davis uh, has been working on this project for how long, Ruth? It's been uh, over uh, three or four years? Seven years. Seven years, okay. And um, there have been other iterations at other artist-run centers. I won't say very much here. I think you all should come to PAVED uh, tomorrow evening at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, to take in her amazing uh, installation work and beyond that too uh, Ruth is going to be delivering a workshop on uh, Saturday at 1 p.m. and uh, that workshop is where you will learn yourself how to uh, taxidermy a bee uh, and even bring the bee back to the living through the magical process of uh, stop motion animation uh, or maybe at least get some insight about yeah, that. Yeah, we can talk about that. Indeed. <laughs> and, um, and then finally, I just also want to encourage you all to check out the billboard on the front of our building because uh, there you will find a 1-800 number that is active. Uh, don't be shy. Just phone that 1-800 number, number and uh, uh, engage with the many options that it gives you. And uh, you may even find yourself uh, in dialogue with the world's foremost bee taxidermist. So, <laughs> uh, without any further ado, I'll turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Art Davis. Well, thank you, uh, David and Marcus and uh, Ruth. It's uh, nice to be here. I'm sorry that um, it was a little bit uh, difficult for me to judge just what level to uh, uh, present this at, so I went fairly general, and I hope you still find it uh, fairly interesting, and uh, I know in the back row there are many uh, very knowledgeable V people uh, uh, there that uh, please chime in if you have anything you want to uh, start to add uh, to that. So let's uh, get started. So um, as uh, Dave was pointing out, I, I teach a course on honeybees. Uh, it's as it often is uh, alternating, and it's not on at the moment, but it uh, hopefully will be on in January again. So I've, I've sort of centered the bee talk a little bit about uh, honeybees, I guess, but this particular bee, perhaps some of you know it, the alfalfa leafcutter bee, which also is uh, very important in Saskatchewan and uh, other parts of the prairies uh, as a specialist of alfalfa pollination. So uh, there are more than honeybees out there and we have a little bit on bumblebees as well. Um, there are at least now, at least seven different species of apis, as they're called, so this is the genus name. Uh, that uh, Linnaeus gave, it means bee in Latin, and uh, there are at least seven species now recognized. Uh, the bee epicenter is uh, in Indonesia, honeybees, that is apis, uh, so it's, uh, please come on. So it's uh, around um, uh, 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 islands of Java and so on, that a lot of these bees are only known. However, 
uh, you might know that uh, two of these seven honeybee species can be kept in hives. That is, they're not a spirit of the dark, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, they can be kept in hives. And what that means is that uh, mankind has uh, sort of domesticated them. And in that way, honeybees, uh, as we know it now, uh, can be moved as colonies, social insect colonies, from uh, place to place as pollination needs occur. So this is uh, Apis serrana uh, here, which is the so-called Indian honeybee, or sometimes the eastern honeybee, and the western honeybee is the uh, A, that's Apis mellifera. That's the first honeybee that was named uh, by uh, Linnaeus working in Sweden. All right, and all the other bees uh, there are in the genus Apis, they are social, but they are um, uh, not kept in hives. And it has to do with their advanced language. And the bees at the corners there, Apis mellifera and Apis serrana, they can convey the sun's position. Uh, they can convey the sun's position uh, to recruits for uh, exploitation of nectar and pollen sources by uh, dancing even in the dark. And their followers uh, uh, understand where they're going. So very important for honeybees, of course is the production of honey, and of course that's available in many different forms, although it's not so easy to get uh, combed honey or chunk honey, but uh, these are where pieces of the uh, comb uh, is involved. So, and, and there was a, a time in the early 1900s in Canada where uh, it was, um, the technology was there for extracting, that is spinning liquid honey out of the combs and selling it as pure honey. However, unfortunately, some early beekeepers were kind of uh, unscrupulous and they were adding like water and so on to the liquid honey and the consumer could detect, well, is it really true honey anymore? And so there was a what's called the comb honey era where it was insisted that uh, even though honey couldn't be extracted, uh, the uh, purchaser of honey was only interested in buying it in the comb, which at that time gave assurance that it was the real thing. Uh, there and now there's of course legislation in place for uh, guaranteeing that. So uh, not far from here, I guess, uh, will be uh, this image of a honeybee swarm that landed on campus. And this is uh, from a friend, uh, Ken Kochu, uh, who's an engineer on campus that uh, sent me this slide that uh, he took uh, there. So I just want to talk a bit about swarming. So this is how honeybees in nature produce new colonies. Usually when they are getting crowded in their hive. Uh, they undergo colony fission, and uh, before uh, they would land in their final spot, it's not uncommon for a beekeeper sometimes even to roll into his or her bee yard, or apiary, as it's called after the genus Apis, and uh, find a swarm of bees hanging from a tree like that. And if you've got an empty box, you can hive that uh, swarm, and uh, you've got a new uh, colony ready to go. The reason that bees cluster like that is uh, in the center of them will be their queen. So this is a queen honeybee. She's quite a bit larger uh, than the other workers. All the bees we're looking at are female here, but the queen is the only one that in most cases will ever lay eggs uh, there. And even though all the bees surrounding her, these are of the worker cast, uh, they do have ovaries, but usually they're not involved in producing uh, eggs. It's usually the, uh, the queen that's doing that. And she uh, then gets, uh, she, of course, a very important part of the honeybee colony, and she gets cared for royally, if you want. Uh, so here she's receiving some food from a worker uh, bee. So she doesn't go out and forage. Uh, that's the job of worker uh, honeybees. So she has to be fed inside the hive. So after about um, the first seven days of her life, uh, she, after she's made it and returned to the colony, she never leaves the colony again, so she's kind of confined. And she so she stores sperm that she receives at mating inside her abdomen, so she doesn't have to uh, mate again uh, there. So the only other time that she would venture out is if the colony has become crowded, and uh, she will uh, then leave with colony. And uh, these are so-called uh, transient uh, swarms. They, they aren't in the final resting place. Sometimes uh, you might see in rural situations, they inhabit a mailbox or uh, so on. And sometimes the uh, beekeeper gets a call that, oh, I've got this swarm of bees just landed in a tree. Could you please come and get them? And a lot of times beekeepers are happy to do that uh, to increase their numbers of colonies. Uh, so bees have very long tongues uh, there, and that allows them to exploit uh, floral sources 
uh, the uh, nectar that's produced at the base of flowers sometimes is fairly deeply seated, and so you need a fairly long tongue in many cases to uh, access it. And so honeybee tongues are about seven millimeters, so you might not have known that uh, arriving here today, but uh, not quite a centimeter long uh, there. And so they will also be used to mop up spills in the hives, so they will clean up um, uh, drips of honey in canola. So I threw this slide in because I thought some of you might uh, know that plant fairly well in Saskatchewan. So honeybees can be important pollinators uh, there. And so these dark green structures, there are four of them, and they are the what we call the nectar producing glands. They're called nectaries. And on their surface, they have uh, these pores uh, here through which the nectar escapes. And the nectar is brought uh, to those dark green structures in phloem. So this is an important uh, sugar conducting tissue inside um, inside plants, right? So here is a bee working the heather, possibly in Scotland. Uh, they're accessing nectar. And if we were to look inside a nectar laden bee, so after it has collected a lot of nectar, uh, this is uh, the honey sac or crop, as it's sometimes called. And this might be pertinent for one of the issues that honeybees and other bees, by the way, are, are uh, dealing with in the environment right now is uh, some early research, uh, unfortunately, has shown that uh, the honey sac itself, it's, it's a greatly expandable sac or compartment, and that's the part of the bee's abdomen that expands as it continues to fly from flower to flower. But unfortunately, um, at least to my knowledge, still currently no uh, bee researcher has ever been shown uh, to, has ever shown that uh, there are, um, say, uh, detoxifying enzymes in this structure. So what it means is, unfortunately, if a uh, bee is collecting a lot of nectar, and if it's not during that foraging trip, uh, consuming some of it, uh, there it may actually venture all the way back to its hive, and then it regurgitates or um, expels that uh, load of nectar, and that's where problems can begin, because the bees that receive it uh, back at the colony then start processing it, and may, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, a bee may have delivered uh, some insecticide uh, during its foraging activities, and that is uh, part of the problem uh, that, that bees tend to face. And when you're talking about social bees, like honeybees, bumblebees, not the leaf cutter bee that we were talking about uh, very early on, uh, but those are, uh, you know, when you're in a social unit and you're passing food around, this is unfortunate that uh, insecticides might uh, venture in uh, to the system there. Uh, so, uh, bees also, honeybees can um, regulate their hive temperature quite well. Uh, so, in the European honeybee, uh, this is, <laughs> you sometimes hear about that saying about, oh, how, uh, you know, why it's important, I'm not sure, but in different hemispheres, how the, the direction of the water uh, goes down the toilet bowl when you hit flush uh, there. And so, European honeybees will fan with heads faced inward. Uh, to their hives, so you see that these uh, bees were most of them we're looking at here. Uh, their sting end uh, is uh, towards us or to the left side, I guess. Uh, there and uh, they fan that way. If we were to show this ape serrana, the Indian honeybee, they they actually face out as they fan. So it's just one of these strange uh, things about hive bees that uh, they are directed in different ways. But what bees are trying to do here is regulate their hive temperature on very hot days in summer. So the uh, best uh, the optimal brood rearing temperature is about 34 uh, degrees centigrade. So that's what uh, bees are trying to do. And at the same time, they are um, cooling uh, in this way by evaporating the water from nectar. If you uh, know maple syrup, for instance, it starts the very, you know, if you dip your finger into the pail on a maple uh, tree during the, the sap run, there, you, you can hardly taste any sugar, right? Because there's so much water that has to be evaporated to get that. Uh, you know, kind of expensive maple syrup that we might buy. It's sort of the same deal with honey, although nectar can be uh, with a lot less water, so the bees don't have quite as much evaporation to do, but that's part of the job they're doing uh, to cool the hive uh, with water. Sometimes uh, uh, bees will even collect water instead of nectar. See, on very hot days, they might be found at uh, the edges of streams or puddles. Uh, they will even sometimes be seen on hot days at the edges of uh, swimming pools, bird baths, uh, dripping uh, taps. Uh, so that's what they're doing. They're trying to collect a bit of water so they can take it back to the hive to cool uh, 
um, cool there. The other activities at the Hive entrance, so uh, not all these are always in the best frame of mind. Uh, I guess when I saw snowflakes falling on the walk over uh, here, I was thinking, oh, here we go. Uh, it's uh, winter, of course, then. So this is what we'd call a guard bee uh, at the Hive entrance, so it has this typical uh, guard uh, posture, body posture, yeah, where uh, you can see the, the mandibles are open, so they're ready to bite a hive intruder. The antenna are outstretched, so they, that's how they, that's the nose kind of of the bee. They're using their antenna to sense the environment, and their four legs, the front pair of legs off the ground, ready to uh, wrestle, I guess, with uh, incoming bees. And I always thought this is just dying for a caption. <laughs> you might know that when you get stung by a little yeah. bee, a little bit of the bee is left behind and that will lead to her uh, demise, but as she's stinging, uh, she is actually releasing compounds that are sort of sounding the alarm for other bees of that hive. So here, sometimes, it doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes even honeybees land at the wrong hive when they come back. And if they don't have a lot of food stores that they can sort of bribe and sort of pacify uh, guard bees, it sometimes resorts to uh, fighting. If a colony is really weak and they can't defend their entrance very well, they're prone to robbing, so honeybees will do that. Uh, it's kind of easy access to food stores. Uh, and uh, so it's sometimes we get more than just interrogation, but actual fighting here. And what's happening there is bees, as they bite, they are from their mandibular glands releasing a chemical called 2 heptanone, which sort of sounds the alarm, and other bees will be alerted and uh, make their way to the hive entrance. And then, if it uh, is thought by the bee to be uh, an intruder that means a sting, uh, that's what's happening here. So, the, you might know that the sting of worker bees are heavily barred. So, if you know the end of a fish hook, uh, think of maybe uh, six to 12 more of those little hooks on each side of the sting. And so, as the bee stings and then the worker bee that is tries to retract uh, her sting uh, it gets lodged in the victim say here and so there's a little poison uh, gland here that is inserting a little more venom uh, into the wound and as she pulls away because the, the barbs get caught she actually tears a bit of her uh, abdomen uh, there and that's what tends to lead to the demise of uh, worker bees in a few hours after that but what is all important I guess for the colony is a much stronger in terms of pheromone that is released, uh, this isopentyl acetate is uh, tens of times stronger than that to heptanone uh, from biting, and this really uh, attracts other bees. So uh, sometimes uh, beekeepers will, will wear gloves uh, in the bee yard for that uh, reason, and after getting stung, sometimes you see other bees that are showing a lot of interest in the area that was uh, recently stung. So there's a bit of a a lark sometimes, I guess, that uh, beekeepers, um, uh, if there's a crew that go into a bee yard, uh, sometimes uh, there might be two or three people on, say, a crew of four that are holding back. They seem to be having slow mornings or whatever. And, uh, you know, when the first ouch in the bee yard is sounded, then they, you know, quickly get into action because usually in that bee yard, that first person's stung is going to attract a little more attention uh, from the bees oh. in the bee yard. And uh, so, because of this uh, isopentyl acetate, uh, uh, it's um, sounding the alarm, right? So we don't usually see uh, that end of a bee, but of course they can defend themselves in certain conditions, but not always. So bees, unfortunately, are prone to natural predators in the environment. So when they're out foraging, all manner of spiders and birds and praying mantises and uh, the like uh, will uh, feast on bees, so it's not the easiest environment uh, for them to to live in. If we can think of honeybees for a minute, um, what tends to happen is that uh, only after, say, the first three to four weeks of a honeybee worker's life do they actually venture outside the hive to start foraging, right? And so the reason is it's thought that uh, in an evolutionary sense, there's uh, the investment into those baby bees is paid back for things like comb construction and um, uh, you know, ripening honey by fanning, guarding the hive entrance, all those kinds of things, before a bee ventures out, because uh, when it then leaves the colony, it's more prone to attack uh, from uh, outside. But the, the real reason why bees are important, and I'll try to point this out, is through their activity as pollinators. I'm sure many of you know that uh, already, uh, and uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. Uh, here and then we'll be finished up. So pollen, 
in many different species is diagnostic, so that uh, pollen is uh, microscopic, so this is the uh, male element of uh, uh, flowering plant in production, so you can see the different sh shapes and sizes of pollen, and it's very distinctive for an individual uh, species. So if you know uh, our provincial emblem, the uh, 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 lily, uh, this uh, is pollen of uh, the lily plant as an example. Uh, here it's the, um, uh, the western, uh, so the, uh, the, uh, uh, the lily shown here are um, uh, uh, showing now the source of pollen. Here, right, so these are anthers as they're called, and just chock a block full of these tiny pollen grains. So those of you who might suffer from hay fever, this is part of the reason that the pollen that is airborne, usually in the form of grass pollen, but not always. Um, why bees are such good pollinators is that their uh, bodies are highly hairy, and not only that, they're branched. So think of little feathers, what we call plumose uh, body hair. So without even trying, uh, they get coated in pollen. So as they fly from flower to flower to flower, usually of the same species, and we'll touch on that a little bit later, uh, they are without trying, as far as we know, they're actually pollinating uh, the species, right? And so they will be able to groom some of that pollen off their body with uh, leg movements there. And in the case of honeybees, you might be able to see uh, a large, what we call a pellet. Uh, so two pellets, one on the left hind leg here and one you can't see on the other side, but together they make the, the load of pollen. Just thousands, hundreds of thousands of pollen grains that uh, bees are removing, in this case, from circulation, but they are not good enough to groom their entire body, so they don't have a negative impact on reproduction, but uh, it's known that plants sort of produce a surplus of pollen probably over time for this reason, that some of it is going to be removed by uh, flower visitors like bees. So here, um, you know, one of the first signs of spring will be catkins of willow uh, in flower, and here is a bee that's uh, possibly overwintered inside the colony now, eagerly out foraging again now that temperatures and uh, the uh, weather allows, and you can see She's raking her legs and packing uh, this pollen onto her hind legs. And what do they do with that? Well, they, they fly home, and that will be an important pollen source for raising baby bees. So here's a, an incoming forager uh, with pollen on her hind legs, and she's looking for a suitable cell uh, into which to kick off uh, those pollen pellets. And you can see then pollen, besides the many different shapes and sizes of pollen, they have distinctive colors. We'll see that a little bit later. Uh, in uh, this talk, and as if uh, the piston inside of our car engines, you know, uh, running back and forth, there the size of the, the bee and her head is such that, because she, she was raised in one of these hexagonal cells uh, there, but her head width is just the right uh, width there that she can come along and uh, butt, butt down uh, the pollen to pack it farther and farther uh, into the comb. So here, is a, a comb that has been cut away because bees use, they build and use both sides of uh, each comb. So we're looking at both sides there, and you can see uh, lots of pollen being stored there. They will add a little bit of honey there, and that helps prevent the pollen from fermenting. It, it gives longer uh, longevity, and so pollen can be fed indirectly or directly, and eventually we get uh, bees, the larvae that will pupate here. So these are the pupil stages. Their eyes start to darken first. And then, without you know, trombones and trumpets uh, sounding, uh, worker bees have to chew their way out using their mandibles and pull themselves out of their cell and joining uh, the workforce. And if we could see this in real nature, there's other bees walking over her and so on. They're not uh, assisting her. There's no midwife, I guess, uh, involved. Uh, it's just uh, she's crawling out on her own. So uh, a plant that's really common in. Uh, Saskatchewan and uh, the Echinacea purpurea, as well as Angustifolia, which is a native uh, plant there, so just spend a bit of time on that. Uh, we had a grad student, Tyler Wist, that was doing his master's project on that, so a very kind of uh, pretty spiky pollen, and if we, as Tyler did, stain it up appropriately, you may be able to see these are the two sperm cells inside each pollen grain, so those are going to be involved with what we call double fertilization, so we need to two sperm cells for that. We won't get fully into that story, but back to canola for a moment. So the pollen is produced at these yellow anthers, but 
if we turn our attention now to this circular structure here uh, by the scanning electron microscope, we see uh, where pollen lands, so that's where pollination happens on the stigma, which is the very top part of the, um, uh, the well, the, the pistil area, which will eventually form the seeds, and the pistil becomes the fruit. So if we just stay with pollen for a moment and zoom in on this area, here is one pollen grain, and you can see that it has germinated. So this is a pollen tube, as we call it, uh, germinating out of that pollen grain. So we're switching species here to impatience for a moment. But you'll see now the elongated pollen tube that is growing out, and here's one that's just starting here. And we're going to uh, poppies on this side here. And then let's go back to Lily. And uh, here we've stained up the pollen tube. And notice here are the two sperm cells here that are being carried down that pollen tube, right? And they are going to be involved in actual eventual uh, fertilization that yields uh, fruit, right? And, and the seeds inside fruit. So very, very important for us. It's estimated that. Uh, you know, if you could add up all, and it's, it's difficult to get accurate estimates for this, but if you could add up all the value of honey and beeswax, say that the honeybees produce, and then, you know, maybe multiply it by 20 to 30 times, that's the real value of, of what bees do for mankind, right, in terms of uh, the pollination. And, you know, when we, uh, maybe not long ago, were uh, taking apples or plums or so, uh, you know, midsummer raspberries off. Uh, our plants perhaps we have in our backyard in Saskatoon, uh, but we aren't always thinking about, oh, this is you know, likely because of a bee or other insect that was there in springtime when the plants were in flower, and now we can sort of reap, uh, reap the rewards. Uh, we're getting a little closer to the end, but I just wanted uh, to point out there are other bees important, of course, even in Canada. Uh, we, we have, um, it's in the range of about 805 known species of bees in Canada. Uh, so it's wow. not, um, you know, most of them are non-social. Uh, so if you think uh, of bees other than the bumblebees and honeybees, uh, they, the uh, bees uh, that we uh, encounter maybe very often are solitary bees, right? So they, they are just individual females. Like that leaf cutter bee we saw on slide one, uh, she has to do everything just for herself there. But uh, So in certain greenhouses in Canada, these happen to be ones in southern Alberta where uh, in, in British Columbia, also very commonly, uh, tomatoes, uh, cucumbers, uh, peppers will be grown indoors, so in glass houses and greenhouses like that. And so um, this was a student that was working out of uh, Simon Fraser uh, University when we were visiting there. And so bumblebees are really good pollinators of tomato. As it turns out, tomato flowers don't produce nectar, and so they're not especially uh, favored by honeybees because of that. They, you know, they can't uh, yield any honey for honeybees. So bumblebees are really good pollinators of, of tomato uh, flowers. And you can tell when a bumblebee has previously visited because uh, you might be able to see these uh, markings at the top where the red arrow is showing. So as the bumblebee is holding on with her mandibles, she actually, uh, without trying, we think, but she marks uh, those um, uh, stamens that she's holding onto there as she pollinates uh, the flower. So uh, this is a very important part of uh, Canada. Now, a lot of times, you know, the tomatoes we might buy uh, in the supermarket are, some of them anyway, are uh, coming from uh, greenhouse production. So getting close to the end here, just to point out that um, if one is really interested, you know that saying about you can lead a horse to water, but you can't sort of make the horse drink the water. And so a lot of times it's very interesting that here is a field of boards. So this is up Highway 41 towards Aberdeen Way. And there was a time in Saskatchewan, especially in the uh, mid to late 90s, where borage was a, a kind of a very nice crop for bees. It's not grown so plentifully anymore. But a lot of beekeepers then would have, because it, in Europe where borage is from, it's, it's known as a you know, famous honey plant. And uh, in the case is here as well. Uh, so you can see the height of these hives, you know, keeping ahead of the bees in terms of uh, nectar storage that would be turned to honey. But what I'm getting at is you can have, in a research way, a device called a pollen trap, and from the front of the hive you can insert that. It has uh, a mesh uh, to it, so if the, the mesh is just the size that an incoming worker bee can squeeze through, if you remember that uh, when she's collecting pollen, it's on the outside of her hind legs, and as she squeezes through, that knocks. It's not a nice thing to do, uh, but from uh, the scientific uh, way, this is a way we can sort of sample 
where the bees have been uh, there. So this is now from the back of the hive. You can pull this tree. This is kind of a, a weekend's work uh, by the bee colony. So you can see a lot of pollen pellets there. So this, if you ever buy bee pollen in the store, that's likely how it's been collected that way. Uh, there. So, um, uh, so what you can do, uh, uh, takes a while, uh, but you can stick handle those different colors of pollen. So, uh, and then you get an idea of uh, where the bees have been. So remember these are from hives that are right beside a borage field and that happens to be this light uh, beige color of borage pollen. But in those early days there was a, um, it, I, don't, I don't think you even see it grown now, but it was called sunola, not canola, but it was a, a, a dwarf sunflower uh, there in, in those particular years we were doing that project. This is the color of uh, sunflower uh, pollen there. And what I'm just trying to show you, I think you can see it best against the black background, but although the colony is all over the place, but individual honeybees are, when they're foraging, they're, uh, they have a high fidelity to just one plant species. How do we know that? Well, we don't see a rainbow of color of different types of pollen, mm -hmm. right, in the pellets. So that makes honeybees excellent pollinators because as they're foraging, they're going from, say, uh, canola plant to canola plant to canola plant. And they're not going to gorge, then canola, then back to gorge, then it's mm -hmm. kind of thing. Bumblebees would do that a little more, and uh, there are thought to be reasons for that, but uh, we won't get into those. But if you just look uh, here, this is uh, near the Aberdeen uh, Ferry area there. So we've got two hives side by side, uh, and along here is just the date of the year. Borage flowers pretty late uh, there, and it's a, it's been a really good honey plant for Saskatchewan beekeepers. And here's just the amount of pollen uh, by dry weight. There. And so you can see this hive, one pea, which has the open boxes, uh, borage tended to be a very important source of pollen for that particular colony. But if you look at hive two pea, which was right beside it in the same bee yard, and borage never got to be higher than third rank for that particular colon, colony, and a lot of times, you know, down in ranking seven, fourth, and fifth. So, so different colonies are doing very different things. We don't know a lot about why. Right? So there's a lot of interest in that because if you could come up with a bee that say specializes on blueberries or cranberries or so on, this would be great for pollination, but we don't really know a lot about that. But just to point out that it is known, uh, here is the norm, you know that the color of the pollen pellets are all the same uh, there with this incoming honeybee, but it is known that even honeybees, uh, we have sometimes what are called mixed loads, right? So different colors in the same pellet. So that's telling us that particular bee it's rare, and that's why it's kind of noteworthy. Uh, it has started off on a plant called Berberus, which has yellow pollen, and then switched to dandelion. If you know dandelions are closely related to um, sunflower, and so they have that kind of orangey uh, colored pollen as well. And then down at the bottom left, I've just thrown in a few black and whites, showing where honeybees uh, have switched back and forth, and so they have dark and light uh, pollen packed. Uh, there. So that's, uh, but the, the norm, you know, 98% of honeybees don't do that switching, and so that's why they're very, very good um, pollinators for that reason. And I think we're at the end, just want to thank uh, many people or sources for the images, uh, so we're on, uh, on good, good terms. I, I want to know who the model was for that shot of the bee sting. Oh, are you crediting uh, him sure. or her? Like, it wasn't my own work, okay. but, but you know, um, uh, it's so common that beekeepers get stung when they're in the bee yard, so it, it probably was just a beekeeper's eye. If you want to photograph, just. <laughs> so it's not um, what, uh, you know, uh, you get used to it, is the way to say it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Some beekeepers I know, all they do is wear a ball cap when they go into their bee yards. They don't have a veil. So if you, you learn as you go, I guess, how to work the colony to minimize stinging. Ruth, if you want to take over next, uh, or, or how would, yeah. so I guess uh, the two of you will you'll stick around, to Art, and sure. then the two yes. of you will maybe yep. be able to answer a few questions yes. together. I'd be happy to. Yes. Uh, so yeah. thank you so much, Art. Okay. I have a friend who is um, a backyard beekeeper, and I'm just thinking about um, what Dr. Davis was saying about um, uh, 
uh, how maybe bees have a tendency to sting some people more than others, and I suspect it has to do maybe with um, that person's emotional state and what uh, what sense they're giving out. But I had this this very dear friend Jeff who has a backyard uh, beehive, and I went to visit him in his beehive, and uh, and he was showing me. Um, how things worked, but he was he was pretty new at keeping bees, and um, and his instructions were, okay, so this is the beehive. They might get agitated. <laughs> if they do, run. <laughs> 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 so I thought, okay, that's so, all right. And uh, and so uh, so we're just we're hanging out. He he seems like a little bit stressed, but it's fine. It's fine. And all of a sudden, he's just you know run. So I ran, but so in the back, in his backyard, um, it's a fairly small backyard, and there's sort of like a, a little bit of space, and around the space, this, um, in the middle, got like a, a planter box. And so I, I was just in full panic mode, and I didn't think to run away, I was just running around. <laughs> the planter box, so, you know, some people are good in emergencies, I am not. <laughs> you, know. um, you may be able to use this. Oh, okay. Try it. So maybe I'll just um, arrow keys. Okay, great. So thank you, Dr. Davis, um, for that wonderful talk. I learned so much. I have photos of all of your slides. <laughs> um, I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll, I'll begin just by uh, just talking about how my project began, and. Um, yeah, and just and just move through the evolution of the project, um, and uh, and then at any point, if anyone has any uh, comments or questions, please feel free. At the end, um, if, uh, if Dr. Davis has a moment, we'll stick around and take some some questions and have a brief um, discussion, if you like. Um, but I, I started this um, project um, until this point. I had been uh, had my practice had been painting. And, and I was an encaustic painter, which means that I was um, making my own paint out of beeswax for the most part. Um, and uh, I'm using natural pigments and using a lot of gold leaf and looking a lot at a lot of like sort of Vatican paintings and um, older sacred paintings and Egyptian um, work with encaustic. And I was spending a lot of a lot of time in my studio alone with these wonderful smells and using raw beeswax that um, that comes with a lot of, um, if you get the unfiltered kind, a lot of bee parts. And so felt pretty um, saturated with um, bees in, in my life and, and I have had a lifelong obsession and it felt like a good time to shift my practice from work that was on the wall to work that was a little bit more or a lot more public participatory. and. Um, public interactive. So I thought, well, what do I want to do? Um, I guess um, the thing that makes the most sense to start is to ask people to send me dead bees that they find in the mail. <laughs> so, which maybe, uh, yeah, so that was uh, the place that I was starting from. And I was imagining myself to be a sort of um, citizen scientist artist um, gathering information from folks. And um, I didn't know what I was going to do with the bees, but I wanted people to um, helped me with this um, public interactive research project where they would send me this bee and um, so folks could, and still can actually, this is, this is still an ongoing project, but um, if someone, is, um, someone finds a dead bee, um, you just email me or you can contact me through uh, my Facebook community page called May I Have Your Bees Please? <laughs> um, and you can find out more about the project there uh, and send me your mailing address and I'll send you a kit in the mail. And in the kit, um, you get uh, a set of instructions, a self-addressed stamped envelope, a questionnaire like this one, um, and um, a small container to put the bee in and a small gift for your trouble. So usually I give people um, I have custom buttons that I've had made, or I like to send very small um, handmade drawings so that it feels like a bit of a, a labor exchange. But I'll just show you a couple of these. So I've got many, many, many of these that have come back, and when I show the work, I show um, my taxidermy bees um, in, in the, sort of the form of a museum. And so when you're, you're looking at all of these bees, this show has 500 of them. 
Um, you can look at a number underneath each of the Bs, and that corresponds to a booklet. And on the booklet is verbatim the information that I've gathered from each of these um, questionnaires. So this is my, one of my absolute favorites. It's from Lucy, age 11, and uh, from Victoria, BC. And she says this really beautiful thing about how she thinks it died. Um, so he was attacked by two wasps who was jealous of his beautiful color and his soft coat. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of brings tears to your eyes a little bit. Yeah. And then this is one of my other favorites by a woman named Cindy Morrison who says, I think this bee tired of living in a fascist society and so escaped <laughs> by hitching a ride on a Ford Ranger. I like the specificity of the Ford. Well, I suppose that she found it in her truck. Anyway, spoiler alert, she found it in her truck. Um, being from a Luddite society, she was not aware of the extreme temperatures possible mm -hmm. in the back of a closed truck. So on, <laughs> on an August day, she died. Okay, so sad. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Cindy. I treasure this. Uh, yeah, so um, around the same time that I was switching up my practice, um, I was looking at other artists whose practice I really admired, and one of them, still my, so it's still one of my favorite artists is Graham Patterson, who has this very um, comedic um, animation um, and diorama-based uh, practice, and this is a show that I saw around the time that I started um, developing this project. Um, and this piece is called Bear Rug, it's from 2008. Um, and one thing that I really loved about this work is if you look very closely at these, um, these little creatures, which are um, stop motion puppets, um, you, they, they very much give you a sense that a hand has, has created these, that they're, they're made from, from things like, you know, fabrics that you recognize and pantyhose and they're hand painted and they have a real sort of like handmade um, craft-like look to them. Um, another artist I really admire and I think about a lot in, in my practice is Bill Burns. And um, Bill Burns ha has this project that started, I think, in 1994 called Safety Gear for Small Animals. And um, so this is just one example. It's a, a very small respirator, but if you look at um, the rest of the work you, that you'll find very small reflective vests and very small gloves and they're just, they're very, um, yeah, they're very dear um, and um, as far as I understand they're made, he's commissioned um, manufacturers of safety gear to make, um, to make these things so it has a lot of interesting things to think about in that practice. So, so I, I was thinking about things like, um, thinking about miniatures and things that are, are made by hand and, and DIY culture and museums and, um, and thinking in terms of, and thinking in a playful but critical way about uh, the representation of um, the natural world and, um, and truth and how information is gathered and, um, and given out. So I made this um, piece, um, I was doing a scholarship program at the Center for Art Tapes. And this is called uh, Bee Taxidermy, a How-To Guide. And so I'll just show you a couple of uh, frames from that. Um, so I was using these really wonderful, um, sort of quite flawed Russian uh, lenses that had gave it this really surreal kind of dreamlike quality that I really enjoyed and have um, brought in to, um, in other ways. Uh, to, to work that I've, that I've done uh, since then. So this is a sort of uh, narrative of DIY and um, and it's, it's quite dark, this video. Um, and this is uh, available um, online as well, um, but it's also being featured alongside the Bee Museum um, in the show. So this is one of, one of the 500 um, bee exhibits, I think maybe number 67, something like that. And so they're presented in these, um, in this sort of museum format, um, glass vitrine, um, and yeah, and the, the show as it's presented has um, 500 of these um, vitrines and 500 of these. So um, in the in the midst of uh, gathering uh, <coughs> bees, it occurred to me that um, as an artist, I only have so many. Um, 
so much power and so many uh, avenues of action at my disposal. Um, but one thing that I thought I could do was um, address the bee problem by beginning to repair them. So um, I started to uh, repair the bees one at a time and then developed this um, quite elaborate taxidermy process of them, which is featured in the video and, um, and in the exhibition in a couple of different ways. Um, so at this point, um, it also occurred to me that I could be um, repairing the bees and preserving them for a future where there maybe were no longer any bees. Um, but a, a skill and a power that I also had was um, I could uh, reanimate them. So I started thinking about uh, integrating stop motion into my practice and I started thinking about artists like Graham Patterson who, who work in stop motion and also just thinking about this aesthetic of uh, this handmade DIY aesthetic and also thinking about using materials in this um, repair practice that are um, reclaimed and recycled. So I use um, almost exclusively um, at this point items that are um, taken from discarded electronics. Um, at this point I was using pieces of, of jewelry um, to, to repair and preserve the bees. And, and at this point I was starting to make these that had movable limbs so that if when I was animating them, they could walk around in a fairly convincing way. Yeah, so this is one, um, a close up of one of the bees. So kind of at this point was constructing them sort of like, you might imagine like a Victorian teddy bear. So sort of like movable, nailed on um, limbs that this is, yeah a very, very small resistor, um, a very small resistor that are quite beautiful when you look um, closely at them and they look like hand-painted beads. And then beginning to uh, make these antennae out of very fine copper wire and braiding it so that um, they could be um, animated again and again, moved again and again without um, falling off from metal fatigue. Um, and, uh, and this is, um, at a time where I'm kind of developing labor and thinking about labor more and more in in my practice, and almost uh, well, and trying to devise more and more sort of uh, labor-intensive ways to uh, taxidermy these bees. At, at this point, it takes about three weeks um, to make to make a bee um, from the beginning of a process to the to the very end. There's a lot of sort of soaking it and drying it and taking it apart and then putting it back together and constructing all of these individual limbs. Um, and, and I think about labor as a, as a kind of um, meditation on care. And, and uh, clearly, I, I'm a person that, that sees maybe like modular work and, and repetition, it sort of suits my, my personality, but I also see this kind of extreme um, repetition and labor as a way of, of expressing and imbuing um, care into the things that I'm making. So this is one, um, yeah, this is one of my, <coughs> one of the, the most um, featured bees because it, it tended to have the most movable limbs. Yeah. So, and then, so the, this is um, a still shot from the first animation that I made. Um, and this is a bee rolling a uh, heavy resistor and in the process crushing this, um, this comb, which was donated by Jeff from earlier on in the talk. Uh, so here's a side view of another bee moving its way through this environment. So this was very, um, a very fairly simple, um, simple sets and I was just learning to, to teach myself how to animate. Yeah, and then things took um, uh, a, a more, maybe slightly more developed direction more recently when I, I made the work that's um, that'll be in the show. So uh, um, I've made six um, three-minute stop-motion shorts that each um, are meant to sort of, um, in a documentary f format, in my mind at least, um, convey different aspects of high life and hive life and tell um, a, a sort of uh, tell a story but maybe in not the most um, linear way and these videos are 
played um, at random. So each time that you watch um, this sequence of six uh, videos, you'll get probably um, a different impression. But I, I started to use a lot of a lot of light painting and making more uh, more and more elaborate sets and, and maybe more elaborate bees. Um, and then just working in these these different sets. This this set is actually made from a cantaloupe. Um, that has been filled with wires and covered in wax, and um, I had quite a quite a lovely winter, just slowly and carefully moving and uh, animating step by step, dragon frame. Yeah, so this is another um, picture of the of this new environment. So taking things in a sort of like I say this um, humbly and with with no expectation that I've succeeded, but in the back of my mind I imagined that it would be pretty great to make sort of like the documentary version of Blade Runner. <laughs> so I was kind of thinking of a, taking on a bit of a, a cyberpunk um, aesthetic that fits, I think, with the um, dystopian, um, sort of dark, uh, um, sort of pastiche kind of um, futuristic vision of this um, this futuristic beehive. Yeah, so just a close up yeah, from, from the animation as well. Yeah, and so this is the, pretty much the last frame of the, of the animation. This is a, um, I, I also um, began to, to shoot these sequences where other bees were, where bees were building each other. So this bee was, <laughs> was on a sort of Frankenstein-esque um, platform and was having its limbs either removed or put on, depending on which direction you played it. And uh, yeah, and other bees um, building and, and deconstructing. Yeah, and so this is what the billboard looks like. Um, well, but you'll put in, yeah, in real life, this is the design for it. So this um, is an active 1-800 number. You can call in and you can choose to either um, donate your found bee to the Bee Taxidermy Museum, which is um, which is this body of work that I'm making. Um, if you would like, if you found a dead bee and you'd like to learn how you can preserve and repair it yourself, I'm very happy to send out. Um, uh, it's a, a PDF piece of art writing that also um, does tell you a step-by-step -step process on how to do this yourself. Um, and then there's a third option to speak to the world's foremost bee taxidermist. Um, all of these calls go directly to my phone. <laughs> However, um, we live in an age of uh, extreme dread um, in terms of interacting or answering the phone. So I have, uh, there, there, at every level, you, you don't necessarily speak to me directly. You can leave um, information or a message or any kind of um, recorded interaction that you'd like. Um, but I will occasionally be answering the foremost be taxidermist line if you wanted to speak with me directly. <laughs> yeah. So that is a bit of context on this work. Um, yeah, and I'm just happy to, to take any questions. Um, we have some discussion if you like. Thanks very much, by the way. <laughs> just before we get into the Q&A, maybe I could uh, uh, take this stool. And I've got another stool over there. Perhaps uh, the two of you can sit up front. And we can have a discussion by seeing both of you. Oh, let me change the lighting on you. A little bit, a little bit. Hang on. I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to turn the house lights on, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have maybe have a question while we're just waiting for the device to come up. Um, Ruth, your questionnaire asks, uh, how do you think the bee uh, died? Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Davis, um, from a scientific perspective, if you were just looking at a dead bee, what sort of forensic clues would you uh, look for? Are there a few things that you would look towards to... Yes, that's a good question, actually, uh, David. That, you know, um, uh, 
it's, it, it depends a little bit if the bee is in isolation. Uh, so it, unfortunately, it, it's known that uh, sometimes if you think of the bee yard where there might be 20 to 40 bee hives and each one at the peak of summer might have 60 to 80 thousand workers. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, sometimes if the bee yard is uh, next to an agricultural field or sometimes it's uh, like a horticultural crop and orchard that has recently been sprayed, you sometimes see masses of dead bees at the hive entrance. So you, um, if, if you, it, unf you know, fortunately that is not as common as it used to be as people are more aware uh, of that and even sometimes uh, beekeepers uh, try to take uh, a bit more assertiveness in that and so they'll even have contracts that are signed so that there shall be no spring uh, during the period that the bee colonies are there. You know, but then it doesn't mean that you know, a neighbor a few kilometers down the road might still spray, but it's not as common to see many dead bees uh, at the hive entrance as it perhaps used to be. Um, if you come across, I think you had one there, Ruth, that mentioned about finding it on the sidewalk or so on, and sometimes you, you know, you're just a regular walking along and there's a dead bee on the sidewalk and that's more difficult to know um, what has happened. It, it can just be old age, so bees don't live forever. And uh, so uh, there's, you know, it, there, there's talk that uh, when honeybees die, they actually just start walking from the hive. So they, they might not even uh, need other bees to uh, eventually carry their dead body out. Uh, that, and so in honeybees, uh, uh, their death sort of is brought on by just hard work. So you hear about busy as a bee, and their, their wings start to become frayed. And when that happens, they're not as uh, able to fly as much. And so that, because foraging is usually their last activity in their lifetime, that usually leads to their uh, demise there. And uh, leaf cutter bees, so on that very first slide I was showing, they, they cut leaf pieces and line their nests so they don't build wax at all and they have tunnels and they line their tunnels with pieces of leaf uh, sometimes even canola blossoms we've seen that they will cut out and, and uh, carry to the hive or to their nest we don't call it a hive in that case and um, what tends to give on leaf cutter bees is their mandibles have uh, dentition so they, they have uh, kind of uh, sharp areas that allow them to cut leaf pieces, but over time the, um, the teeth on the mantles are worn and they just can't cut anymore when that, when that happens. So there's different reasons for bees to uh, reach their demise even through old age. I'm, I'm wondering about you as an artist, and you obviously have an affinity for bees and you like bees. I'm just imagining getting these bees and then you have to sit there and like pull their legs off and drill through them and what what does that do for your art and how does that sort of make you feel while you're doing it? Uh, initially I, I thought I made a, a big mistake and I should not have asked a lot of strangers to mail me dead things. <laughs> uh, I, had a, I had a studio that was, let's be honest, a closet, although it was being rented to me as a room. And, and so I was in this, going through a, just an interesting time in my life in this very small studio making very large drawings and working on these very small bees. Um, and initially had a, a really um, intense reaction of, of repulsion and hadn't, and had this very idealized um, image of, of, of dead bees being sort of like um, scentless, um, lovely like light things um, but actually they, they rot and give off a smell um, as, as a, no judgment we all we all do um, and uh, and so I had, <laughs> so this this whole um, taxidermy process actually was began as um, a way to to deal with that uh, level of uh, that reaction and so I started okay well I don't know what I'm gonna do so. So I put them, I would initially put them in the freezer to get rid of any, um, anything that might be living in them, and then I started soaking them in alcohol. Um, and now I've become really um, very blasé about it, maybe too blasé, so, um, but yeah, initially um, I had, I definitely had a, a, 
a reaction to that. And when I made the instructional video with the, the macro lenses, there's scenes of, of taking them apart and, and pinning them with, with quite good sound. Um, not to brag, but say that does sound a lot like how it does. And um, yeah, and I was kind of processing these feelings of, of revulsion by making a kind of, yeah, this deadpan instructional um, artifact that was actually quite repulsive. Yeah. <laughs> so to answer your question. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Definitely got a feeling of your feeling. <laughs> <laughs> feeling of this. But I wanted to maybe press you a little more about that. Um, I, I mean, I, I, your, your, your project as a whole, I mean, bees we think of as a kind of a bellwether, yes, of the state of the environment, mm -hmm. said, right? And so I think your project as a whole certainly draws attention to that and, and raises awareness, et cetera, et cetera. And, but I, and I find uh, your, your methodology, the taxidermy, like very interesting and full of contradictions because whereas taxidermy, is, I'm no expert in it, but it seems to me that stuffing animals was perhaps at first a way of celebrating them and celebrating nature, et cetera, et cetera, and regarding the beauty of these wonderful things. But it was also um, a kind of a, uh, the mark of the master. In, in a way, right? That these animals that we have stuffed, we have probably gone out and hunted, and it's, it, it, it's a sign of my overcoming nature as well. And how do you situate your practice with, with that kind of history? Yeah, um, I um, definitely um, see, yeah, like, see how taxidermy exists between this very violent, um, narrative and the kind of um, harm that comes from uh, telling stories from, um, from, a, from a colonial, museological perspective and, um, and delivering this, uh, this, this concept, this romanticized idea of, um, of, the, of, this, of the natural world from the perspective, from, from a, a kind of um, more violent, more oppressive uh, framework and and this sort of um, anthropomorphization of animals that happens in, in dioramas and and I'm I'm there's a yeah there's a, there's there are a lot of things that I'm thinking of um, in in my practice um, and I yeah I, I have been thinking um, more and more about um, about how how my practice uh, exists within um, narratives of museums and nostalgia and miniatures and how that sort of longing that you feel um, for miniatures comes from from this kind of nostalgia that comes from these uh, yeah these these um, oppressive frameworks that are delivered through museum contexts. Um, does that answer your question? Well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, it just seems like a very kind of uh, problematic as it stands now, tax, the, the, the idea of taxidermy. But, you know, I think it's also, it's perhaps something that's not ultimately fixed, right? So, I mean, maybe your practice is a, is a way of sort of reviving some aspect of taxidermy or, you know, you know uh, keeping it fluid in some way. There's one thought that I had, if I might uh, interject, is uh, um, because I think this you're onto something with this, uh, definitely, but it's... Um, it's interesting how uh, that horizon that you, you mentioned of nostalgia, which is kind of, uh, in some respects, optimistic, um, is unfolded into uh, this pathos in your work. Uh, because it's, it's like uh, the uh, nostalgia that's sort of turned in a certain sense. And I, like I'm thinking of that she's named her exhibition Ideal Bounds, which is actually a, a quote from Frankenstein, and that these are are not just taxidermy, they're also cyborgs. They're, so yes. There's something monstrous uh, uh, about their re revivication uh, that is, is also kind of at play in, in the work of, well, is that fair? Um, yeah, I'm, I, um, as the, the sole curator um, of the Bee Taxidermy Museum, I imagine myself mm -hmm. having this uh, very, uh, on one hand, um, inhabiting this character that is 
very sincerely trying to fix this very serious problem by repairing um, these bees and then um, and then reanimating these bees. But it it um, this this well-intentioned um, and very laborious act becomes um, quite ghoulish when you see when when you actually interact with with the bees and make these things and uh, and see uh, see the videos and see them in person um, where maybe this maybe there's a part of this character that is um, very determinedly uh, making this extreme effort to fix things but it's maybe not doing the best job yeah. <laughs> maybe sitting against nature yeah but also when you get these they're all really dead it's not like you're going out and Oh no! Uh, please don't do that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big difference, right? Yeah, and and I hope that it comes across that that folks in are, are not meant to, to kill them. No, be hunter. <laughs> well, have you had anyone send you one that they say I killed? Here it is. Well, I had to shift things a little bit because I did get one questionnaire from a person named Lois, and oh, she's yeah. I know last names, and I I wouldn't give it away anyway um, because. Uh, it's under, how do you think, it's, it was, where was it to be found in my kitchen, how do you think it died, newspaper. And so <laughs> I, I had to make sure that it was very, very, very clear, please. although I expect that um, Lois's bee upon this, this reflection was killed out of maybe uh, Lois's desire not to be bothered by it more than her wanting to send me. But yeah, and just think she's kind of an animal or a brief reaction or whatever. Yeah. She was killing it so that she didn't get stung or something. That could be. You feel better. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. A uh, question for Dr. Davis. What is your opinion, as a gentleman who clearly studies bees and cares for bees, that these bees are being shown in this light? Oh, that's a good question, too. I, I, you know, I, um, I think. Anytime bees are in the news, it's a good thing uh, that um, uh, they, well, uh, if they're in uh, news that brings attention to them, that's a good thing, I think, because we tend to undervalue the importance of bees, uh, generally. If you think of the, you know, harvesting of fruit as one example, you know, that we probably know that bees are, you know, uh, you know forging uh, back and forth between, uh, uh, you know, blossoms that are, uh, on trees, uh, say apples, oranges, plums, uh, you name it, sort of thing, cherries. Uh, but um, a lot of times we maybe have a disconnect when we're actually, you know, harvesting or maybe just sitting down at lunch and biting an apple and we don't really reflect a lot on uh, how it came to be in your lunch bag uh, kind of thing or, you know, on the tree before that. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think it's kind of a neat thing. I, I uh, I, I didn't know a lot about uh, Ruth's uh, work on, on these until um, you know, we were sort of um, uh, you know, directed together, I guess, in the last little while uh, there. But it's, um, you know, it, I think, you know, when people see Ruth's work, they're thinking about, well, how, you know, if, if they know that, you know, she's been receiving dead bees, well, how, how did it happen that that particular bee might have died and so on? And it, probably raises awareness, which is a good thing, I think, uh, generally speaking. Uh, because, uh, you know, not all bee species are, you know, in, in dire straits, but uh, there are some that are, and uh, generally speaking, it's not a bad thing to, you know, probably bring this nature to art in a kind of an interesting way. So. It's always such a pleasure, um, since I can't quite to be an expert in anything but my practice, um, and, and I don't, don't pretend to, to be any kind of expert on, on bees or, or even um, bee ecology, so it's such a, I feel so grateful and it's such a gift to have, to have um, co-presentations with folks like uh, Dr. Davis who can um, offer, um, yeah, more um, science-based information. I just want to thank you, thank you both actually for, for, for talking to us today. and I. It's more of a comment, but I just want to thank you for also putting out, bringing out this platform, this dy potential dystopian world, sort of through humor, and making it even more palatable for people that might not otherwise have even engaged into this territory, and just sort of looking at it through that lens and, and uh, recognizing and learning about the 
you know, what, what befalls a lot of our bees and our agriculture and our, you know, as a result as well. So thank you for that. Yes. I want to thank both of you. Did you have something to say? Sorry, yeah, Sorry. I, I'm willing to um, extend this further. <laughs> oh, no, I, well, I, um, it, I guess it's just kind of the, the elephant in the room in a certain sense. But the, a lot, a lot of I think what's sort of in the in the ethos here is this uh, phenomenon of colony collapse syndrome, yeah, and the the um, this kind of uh, uh, you know threat that I, maybe it is because we've also industrialized uh, um, the uh, pollination uh, processes to such a degree because there, there's trucks that move bees around now, right, from orchard to orchard and, and things of that nature. And when colony collapse syndrome happens in those kinds of environments, it's very rapid. It moves uh, through and, and does a, um, you know, a lot of damage uh, in, in a short period of time. Um, and I, I think that's something that um, that I derive from the pathos in your work, Ruth.